Okay. So today's topic of discussion is a very important topic, which everyone says and feels it is very difficult, which is about fluid management. So like our usual discussion, today's uh, theme will be based on, I'll be telling you about some basics about uh, what is fluid, what is electrolyte. Then we'll be discussing about uh, individual fluids, about their composition. Then finally, we'll go to the very practical aspects. And we maybe, if time permits, we'll discuss some case scenarios which you are giving. Right. So whenever someone speaks about fluid management, the first year physiology basics always comes. Uh, out of the total body weight, roughly 60% of the total body weight is water. So example for a 70 to 70 kg person, 60% roughly comes around 78 liters or 78 kg, which is water. The entire water is divided into two components. I'm going a bit fast here because these basics, you know, intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. The majority of the fluid will be intracellular. That is two thirds of the fluid is intracellular. So out of 48, if you say two thirds, it will be coming around uh, 32. So 32 liters is intracellular, but the most important component is the extracellular fluid, the remaining 16 liters. So among these 16 liters, 75% or the majority of ECF is plasma. Right, the remaining 25%. So 16 liter, 75% roughly comes around uh, uh, 12 I'm sorry, 12 liters is interstitial fluid. 75% is interstitial fluid and only 25% which is 3 liters or 4 liters comes around uh, plasma. So in short, we have only 3 important fluid components in the body. One is ICF, next is the interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is uh, the one which is present in the tissues and plasma the one which is circulating in the blood. So plasma is also called as the intravascular volume. Intravascular volume is around 3 liters. So even though there are totally 48 liters in our human body, only 3%, that is only 3 liters is the intravascular volume, which is very short. So the balance between intracellular fluid, interstitial fluid and plasma maintains the entire fluid balance. So if this is one basic, now the next basic is What's the electrolyte component of the fluid components? Just a simple basic. The extracellular fluid or the plasma and interstitial fluid contains mainly sodium, chloride, uh, calcium. So, you know, the normal extracellular fluid sodium level is 136 to 146 milli equivalent. We'll just take it as a single value as 140. The normal chloride level, you know, is 96 to 106. Roughly, we'll take it around 100. Uh, calcium, I'm not sure of the milli equivalents, but it is higher in the ECF. Potassium is very low in the ECF, 4 milli equivalents. 3 to 5 is the range. We'll take it as 4 milli equivalents. In contrast, what does intracellular fluid contain? It is the straight opposite. If sodium is 140 outside, it is just 4 inside. Whereas potassium is again the opposite. If it is 4 in the ECF, it is 140 in the ICF. So sodium is the predominant extracellular fluid uh, ion. Potassium is the major intracellular fluid ion. Apart from that, albumin, the other proteins, most other proteins, everything will be intracellular phosphate. These are intracellular. So one carrier message is sodium is predominantly extracellular. Potassium is predominantly intracellular. This is just to brush up your basic physiology knowledge. Okay, and hope you know about the terms osmosis, diffusion, because we'll be discussing these terms. I'm not going into the basics in the relevant places we'll tell them. Okay, now coming to the main topic as such.
Just a sec. Okay. Yeah. Can Sabrish hear? It's showing connecting yeah, yeah, to audio. Yeah, okay. Okay. So coming to the basics of fluid therapy. So whenever you are giving a fluid orders to a patient, we have a few questions in mind. Like, what is the fluid to be given? Or first question is, whether to give fluid to this patient or not? That is the first question. You are getting a person with uh, known heart disease. That's the only issue it's known. We'll be always having that fear, whether to give fluid for this patient. Are we going to overload this patient? So first question before giving a fluid is whether to give fluid to this patient or not. That is always the question. Second, if you decide to give fluid to the patient, what fluid to give? This will be the second question. If you decide on this is the fluid to be given, then you should know what is the dose and what is the duration or how long you should give the fluid. So these are the basic questions when you are prescribing a fluid therapy. And the last one is how to monitor when to start. The first two questions are the most important questions because always we get confused whether to give fluid to a particular patient or not and regarding the choice of fluid for the particular patient. So we'll be discussing every step one by one. Initially, we'll start with step two. <clears throat> what fluid to give in which situation? So to understand this question number two better, we'll discuss which are the fluids available. So the fluids available can be classified into three actually. Okay, I think I need not confuse you with that. We'll just randomly tell about the fluids which are available. One is NS. NS is also called as isotonic saline or 0.9% sodium chloride, which is saline. The next commonly used fluid is ringer's lactate RL. We have 5% dextrose. We have 25% dextrose. We have 0.45% saline, which is half normal saline, half NS. Then half DNS. DNS, which is dextrose plus 0.9% saline. So this is one category of fluids. Then we have isolates. There are four isolates, isolate G, isolate P, isolate M, isolate E. So these two together, they are called as crystalloids because they are clear fluids. So they are called as crystalloids. We have some groups of thick fluids, which are called as colloids. Among colloids, there are many pentastarch, starch, two commonly used are albumin. We have both 5% albumin as well as 25% albumin. Next is you would have heard a uh, hemocele. Colloids is not our topic of discussion today because this uh, colloids are mainly surgical fluids. We usually do not use them because we still consider crystallites are the best. So to understand how a fluid acts, just you should know its concentration. I'll be telling the importance one by one. So we'll be starting with uh, the most commonly used fluid, which is 0.9% saline, also called as normal saline. So you know very well that normal saline contains only two components. Okay, it contains 154 milli equivalents of sodium and 154 milli equivalents of chloride, that's all. It's just uh, salt. So what they tell is, one liter of 
0.9% saline contains 9 grams. That's that's what is 0.9% saline. So 1 liter should contain 9 grams of salt. So these are the only two components of 0.9% saline. So if you calculate this together, the total osmolality is 309 milli equivalents. Just remember this, I'll tell the importance later. The next uh, fluid is 0.45% or half normal saline. Half normal saline is half of this. So it contains 77 milli equivalents of sodium and 77 milli equivalents of chloride. So total osmolality is 150. Okay, so two things are done. Next, what about ringer's lactate? You would have heard that ringer's lactate is called as the most physiological fluid. Okay, why it's called most physiological fluid? It contains uh, 130 milli equivalents of sodium. It contains potassium, which is 4 milli equivalents. It contains 109 milli equivalents of chloride. It contains calcium, which is 3 milli equivalents. It contains lactate. Lactate is 28 milli equivalents. So now you can see why this is called as physiological fluid. Because I told you the normal extracellular sodium is 136 to 146 or roughly 140. If you see sodium chloride, uh, saline, it is very high. It is 154 milli equivalents. It is very high than the physiological level. Whereas RL contains 130, which is in, nearly in the physiological range. Similarly, normal chloride level in the body is 100. Whereas in normal saline, it is 154, which is dangerous. Whereas in RL, it is only 109, which is again more physiological. Potassium is 4 in RL. Potassium is not present in normal saline. I told you calcium is also an extracellular fluid. The same calcium is present in RL, which is not present in any other fluid. Remember, calcium is present totally in only two fluids. I'll tell what are they. One is RL. Similarly, we have lactate. What's the function of lactate is, in the presence of a normally functioning liver, remember this, in, in the presence of a normally functioning liver, lactate gets converted to bicarbonate. Okay. Lactate gets converted to bicarbonate in the presence of a normally functioning liver. So bicarbonate acts as an alkali. Hence, it can correct acidosis. So if someone asks you, can you name a fluid which can correct acidosis? One is RL. But RL corrects acidosis in the presence of a normally functioning liver. And if you calculate the total osmolality of fingers lactate, uh, It will come around some 286 something. So again, it is more physiological. Because the normal human osmolality is around 300. Uh, NS contains more. So that's why R is called as the most physiological. So next time, if whenever you see an RL, always remember it contains sodium. 130, chloride 109, uh, potassium 4, it contains extra calcium and lactate. The function of lactate is in the presence of a normally functioning liver, it gets converted to bicarbonate, hence it can correct acidosis. Okay, so R is done. Next, 5% extrose. 5% extrose is easy because it contains only dextrose. 5% means 5 grams in 100 ml. So, 500 ml. ML of ID bottle will contain around 25 grams of glucose. It contains only glucose. This 5% dextrose is called as a hypotonic fluid. I'll tell you why. Glucose is normally taken up by the cells and utilized. So remember I told you three fluid components, right? ICF, plasma and interstitial fluid. So whatever fluid we are giving through IV goes into the plasma. So we are injecting 25 grams of glucose plus 500 ml of water in plasma. 
I told you this glucose gets absorbed by the cells. So whatever glucose we give is completely absorbed by the cells, and what is left is just pure water. So this pure water is going to dilute the plasma. When plasma gets diluted, what happens? Through, due to osmosis, more fluid from the plasma will start going into the eye cell. Right? That is what is osmosis. So even though we are giving 25 grams of glucose plus 500 ml of water into the plasma, the glucose gets utilized by the cells. What remains is pure water which is going to dilute the plasma, which makes the plasma hypoosmolar, leading to more leakage of plain fluid into the ICF. So the 5% extrose is going to hydrate the ICF, but it is going to dehydrate the plasma. I told you the 3 liters of plasma is the most important component. So even the 5% extrose is good for the cells, it is very bad for the plasma. So you, it should be never given in conditions where you have to retain water in the plasma. For example, in any case of hypovolemic shock. Patient is already in shock, already patient is in hypovolemia. If you are going to give 5% extras, it's of no use because it is still going to dehydrate the plasma. Any doubt in this concept? Can you explain that? I understood. But can you just repeat that once more? Just that. Yeah. So the three points. fluid components are, yeah. So the three important fluid components are intracellular fluid, plasma, and interstitial fluid. Whatever fluid, uh, IV fluid we are giving, we are giving it only in the plasma. So in case of five percent extrose, if we give, what happens is we are injecting twenty five grams of glucose along with five hundred ml of water into the plasma. Glucose being a su utilizable substance, it gets utilized by the cells. So what remains is just 500 ml of plain water, which is going to dilute the 3 liters of plasma. So now the 3 liters, even though it becomes 3.5 liters, all the electrolytes here become very diluted. So as per the rule of osmosis, fluid moves from the area of low concentration to high concentration. So all the fluid which you have injected in the plasma is going to move from the plasma to the ICF. So when it moves like that, again, plasma is going to lose fluid. There is no use of giving. Uh, 500 ml of water into the plasma. But ICF becomes full with water. ICF includes brain tissue also, brain cells. So if you are giving dextrose, the brain cells start accumulating more water and it can swell and it can cause cerebral edema. Whereas the plasma loses swell. So 5% dextrose should not be given in situations where plasma volume is already lost. Example, in hypovolemic shock, in severe vomiting, severe dehydration, we should never give 5% extrose. Similarly, it should not be given in conditions which can cause cerebral edema, any brain lesion. For example, a neurosurgery, a meningitis, a stroke patient, you should never give dextrose containing fluids because it is going to cause more of cerebral edema. Right? There is another reason why. Uh, Dextrose containing fluid should not be given in hypovolemic shock. One is the reason I told you due to osmotic shift. The second reason is excess of glucose is going to cause glycosuric, that is, osmotic uh, diuresis is going to happen. This again will lose more water. So, 5% dextrose, if you are giving, it's of no use to the plasma because it gets osmotically shifted into the cells, causing more of cerebral edema. And the excess glucose is going to get excreted through the kidneys due to osmotic diuresis. So 5% dextrose or any glucose containing fluid in that matter is not an ideal fluid to retain in plasma. Okay, so 5% dextrose is done, 25% dextrose. So, 25% dextrose is 25 grams of glucose is present in 100 ml of fluid. That's the same complication here. It should not be given in shock. But the thing is, it gives more concentration of glucose in just a short amount of fluid. Right, so 25% dextrose, you know. Half NS we have discussed, I think. Next comes... 
DNS. DNS is the same constituent as that of NS. 154 millicolons of sodium, 154 millicolons of chloride. To sit So welcome back. So regarding 25% uh, extras, we completed. Before that, just a small correction. I told you the total osmolality of RL was 280 something. It's actually 274. Sorry for the error. So the next fluid is DNS. So DNS contains the composition of NS, which is 154 millicolons of sodium, 154 millicolons of chloride. Plus, it contains 5% extras. So, it has the characteristics of both NS as well as 5% extras. The one advantage of DNS over 5% extras is since it contains sodium and chloride in addition to 5% extras, it retains fluid in the plasma itself. So, even though the glucose gets utilized by the cells, the remaining sodium and chloride gets re retained in the plasma itself. So, it can retain more of volume. So this is one advantage compared to 5% excess. But still, DNS is not preferred in shock because the excess glucose can cause osmotic diuresis, which can again can cause hypotension. But among the two fluids, 5% extras and DNS, which causes more of hypotension is 5% extras because of the two reasons I told earlier. DNS is relatively safer, but preferably do not use it in cases of hypotension. So this and another fluid which we have to discuss is 3% saline. So normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. 3% saline is, it contains 513 millicolons of sodium. 0.9 contains one, normal saline contains 154 millicolons. 3% saline contains 513 millicolons of sodium, which is very high. So this finishes one group of crystallites, which is 0.9% saline, 0.9% saline or normal saline, half normal saline, ringer's lactate, 5% dextrose, 25% dextrose, DNS. We have half DNS also, which is 0.45% saline plus 5% dextrose. And we have 3% saline. Just a small word about isolates. I told you we have four isolates, isolate G, isolate M, isolate P, and isolate D. So I'll just uh, write down the components for a comparison. So coming to isolate G, G stands for gastric. Okay, so you know very well that the content of stomach is nothing but hydrochloric acid. So it contains more of chloride. It contains 150 millicolons of chloride. But it is still second to that of normal saline. I told you normal saline contains 154 millicolons of chloride, whereas isolate G contains 150 millicolons of chloride. Potassium is 17, sodium is 63. All isolates contain 50 grams of glucose per liter, 5% that is. The other important component of isolate GD is it contains ammonium chloride, 70. Right, ammonium. Ammonium, what happens is it gives out H+, which is an acid. So the two important components of gastric solution is H+, and chloride. So chloride is present in 150. Ammonia is present um, Ammonia is present in isolate G, which gives out H+. Now, like I told in oral, in the presence of a normal liver, 
lactate in RL gets converted to bicarbonate, which can correct acidosis. Similarly, in isolate G, there is ammonium, which gives out H+, plus, okay, which can correct alkalosis. So, if someone asks you to suggest a fluid which can correct acidosis, it has to be RL in the presence of a normal liver. If someone asks you to suggest a fluid which can correct alkalosis, it has to be isolated. One situation which can cause alkalosis is vomiting, right? In vomiting, we lose of more of acid, so which leads to alkalosis. To correct that, we have to give acid. Isolate G can correct acidosis. But one disadvantage of ammonium is, ammonium is nothing but ammonia. It is toxic, uh, toxic product of liver. So it, this cannot be given in cirrhosis. Or it aggravates, aggravates hepatic encephalopathy because of ammonia. So this is all you have to know about isolate G. It has the high chlorate content. It gives acid. So it corrects alkalosis. Plus it should not be given in the case of cirrhosis. Now coming to isolate TM. I'm not mentioning the osmolality here because it is not the concern. It's, it is lower actually. So isolate TM, as I already told, it contains 50 grams of glucose. M stands for maintenance. I told you isolate GG stands for gastric. M stands for maintenance. I'll tell you the meaning of maintenance later, but just remember it contains 40 millicolons of sodium, 35 millicolons of potassium, uh, 40 millicolons of chloride. It contains 20 mm of acetate. The function of acetate is it functions like lactate in RL. Acetate gets converted to bicarbonate. So again, it this corrects acidosis. So two fluids which can correct acidosis are isolate M and isolate uh, and R. Plus this contains phosphate, 15 mm of phosphate. M stands for maintenance. I'll tell you why it is called as maintenance later. Next isolate is isolate P. P stands for pediatric. Because isolate P is used as pediatric maintenance fluid. So the same 50 grams of glucose. The same components but in a little lower level. 25 millicolons of sodium. 20 millicolons of uh, potassium. 22 millicolons of chloride. This also contains acetate. So again this can correct acidosis. Plus again, phosphate and citrate will be. There's another isolate called isolate E. Same 50 grams of glucose. It contains 140 millicolons of sodium. E stands for extracellular replacement solution. So this is similar to RL. It contains most of the extracellular ions. So it contains 140 millicolons of sodium, 10 chloride, uh, 10 potassium, 103 millicolons of chloride. It contains 47 millicolons of uh, acetate, which can correct acidosis. Plus, it contains calcium, magnesium, and citrate. The only fluid which has magnesium is isolate E. The two fluids which have calcium are RL and isolate E. So, this is just about the composition. Right? Any doubts still here? Till, this is the only theoretical portion which we'll be discussing. Other things will be practical. So why I taught very extensively is these are small, small things. But if you know this, this only we can uh, plan giving fluid for a managed, management for a patient. For example, if you know the fluids which contain potassium, you can give those fluids in hypokalemia. Uh, can you tell the potassium containing fluids? Almost all the fruits contains the uh, potassium in this isolates. Okay. Almost so isolates are the highest concentration of potassium. See the list also. Uh, isolate M has the highest concentration of potassium, 35. So most of the isolates are potassium. In the normally used, in the first list of things, we have RL. So NS does not contain potassium. RL has potassium. Most of the isolates are potassium. Now, uh, 
which contains calcium i told you rl contains calcium isolate e contains calcium which fluid contains magnesium isolate e contains magnesium so if there is a hypomagnesemia we are supposed to give some fluid to correct that hypomagnesemia we can give isolate e uh, similarly if a patient is starving he is not taking any food we are supposed to give uh, fluids which contain dextrose like dns 5% dextrose and all isolates can be given for that purpose because it contains glucose and you should know which are the fluids which can correct acidosis which are the fluids which can correct alkalosis so which are the fluids which can correct acidosis those which form bicarbonate so the first important thing is rl next is the most of the isolates isolate p isolate m because they contain acetate they get converted to bicarbonate so these are the isolates which can fluids which can correct acidosis right so in cases of alkalosis that is fluids which correct alkalosis ns can correct alkalosis ns in high amounts can cause acidosis okay remember that so ns itself can cause acidosis the other things are isolate g because isolate g contains ammonium chloride that ammonium chloride uh, forms h plus which can correct alkalosis so that is the ultimate purpose of giving you this list so whenever you are prescribing a fluid you have to take into consideration few things like the choice of fluid depends on these few things one is the volume status of the patient okay the whether the patient is in shock whether the patient is just dehydrated the patient is in a normal volemic state the next thing is we should know about their electrolyte status the third thing is we should know about their acid base status these three things decide what fluid to give for example a patient is having a hypokalemia uh, just to make a guess patient is having hypokalemia his potassium is just uh, 3.3 something patient is having vomiting in this scenario what fluid you will prescribe plus patient is dehydrated or patient is in hypovolemia we can give tenormectin i told you these are the three things we should have patient is in hypovolemic status due to vomiting he is in hypokalemia acid base status is not known what what fluid you may prescribe here tenormectin why so i say like g or uh isolate g can be good no yeah isolate g is good because it contains high amount of potassium so potassium and also can replace correct calcium yeah correct vomiting is loss of acid so he has lost acid so obviously he will be having alkalosis so isolate g is a good option or if isolate g is not available only the basic amount of fluid is available ringus lactate is again a good choice because it also contains potassium it contains 4 milligrams of potassium so it can correct hypovolemia and sorry it can correct hypokalemia it can correct the volume status because it is doesn't contain dextrose so it retains more of fluid in the plasma so the second component volume retaining is done plus as you told rl in the presence of a normal liver can correct acidosis but that is one sorry that's one wrong aspect here right yeah it is it is going to cause uh, more of more acid alkalosis more alkalosis more alkalosis so the other two things it is okay but since it is causing more alkalosis it may not be an ideal choice what about ns ns can retain volume right mm -hmm. it corrects yeah. uh, alkalosis i told you in high amounts more than 1 liter ns can cause acidosis so the alkalosis component is corrected but it doesn't give potassium mm -hmm. yeah. so you can either choose ns with the extra potassium supplement you can give or amandi is the best choice to isolate g 
sir ns in high amounts causes acidosis right causes acidosis okay. vomiting will cause alkalosis okay so isolate g i think for this scenario isolate g is best suppose if this patient is not having an acid base disturbance so his acid base status is normal i think rl will be a better choice it corrects two, two things ns also will be a better choice so this is how you plan treatment suppose if he is having a diarrhea rl will be the better choice because diarrhea fluid is more of bicarbonate he is losing more of bicarbonate he is in acidosis so rl will cause alkalosis right so generally what they tell is rl is the fluid of choice for diarrhea ns is the fluid of i mean it's not the choice isolate is the fluid of choice for uh, vomiting upper gi disorders rice tube aspiration but among simple fluid ns we can give for vomiting because it causes acidosis like so based on the situation you have to decide so when you prescribe the fluid you must know the composition of each of the fluid you must know the volume status of the patient electrolyte status of the patient and the acid base status right any doubt still here so okay till now we dis some idea we got no i am going to the yeah. main aspect so yeah. till now what we discussed is the fluid components and how to decide what fluid to give Now, whether to give the fluid to the patient. So, what are the indications of fluid? Then we'll finish with the how to give dosing in that end. So, these are the practical aspects, the indications of fluid therapy. Do all patients need fluid? No. So oral fluid is the best. Always oral is the best because patient knows how much he needs. He drinks as he wishes, and it is tolerated by the body. So in any situation, oral fluid is the best. It is more physiological. So IV fluids are indicated mainly when patient is not able to take oral fluids. This is the basic principle. So it's not an ideal practice when you know, if you, uh, any patient gets admitted to the ward, we have to give IV, IV fluid. It is not the rule. Okay, if the patient is able to take orals normally, he is admitted for some other indication. There is no need to give IV fluids if he is able to take normally. So the indications where we can give IV fluids are grossly divided into three categories. One is maintenance fluid. maintenance fluid is concept is simple the same thing patient is not able to take oral fluids or oral any oral things for that matter he has a particular daily requirement for his body weight for his metabolism we are just replacing that that is called as maintenance so examples of this will be patient post surgery so the patient is in need for oral post surgery or uh, some abdominal conditions like pancreatitis etc where he doesn't take any oral fluids till he is not taking oral fluids we can give our patient in coma from the medical side you can consider patient is in coma in such patients the daily requirement we are supplying now what's the daily requirement that is the question remember these values for an adult the daily requirement of fluid is 40 ml per kg per day right the daily requirement of fluid for an adult will be 40 ml per kg per day so for a 50 kg person roughly needs 2 liters of fluid 60 kg means 2.4 liters or 2.5 liters right so 2 liters means 4 pints of fluid so roughly a 50 kg or a 60 kg person needs Four to five pints of fluids per day. In pediatric, they'll tell one formula, right? You would have heard this: hundred ml per kg for the first ten kg. Then,
So for a 10 kg baby, it will be 1,000 ml, 1 liter. Plus, for the next 10 kg, 11 to 20 kg, we are going to add 50 ml per kg. For the next 10 kg. So this will come around 1,500 ml for a 20 kg baby. Plus 20 ml per kg for the remain. For more than 20 kg. So this is another formula for a pediatric kids. So the adult daily requirement will be 40 ml per kg of fluid per day. Pediatric will be 100 ml per kg for the first 10 kg. Then beyond that 50 ml per kg for the next 10 kg and 20 ml per kg for the beyond. The whole day agar formula, no? Yeah, sorry. This is a whole day agar formula. Yeah. Yeah. That is for pediatrics. In adults, we don't use it. Adults, 40 ml per kg, that alone is enough. So when the patient is coming on day one, these things will be adequate. Based just on the body weight, you can calculate how much fluid he requests. But later on, we can individualize it by means of insensible water loss. So you know very well that uh, this is taken from a book called Sanjay Pandya. 500 ml of fluid is lost through skin. Another some uh, 400 ml is lost through lungs breathing. 100 ml is lost through fecus. So around 1000 ml is lost per day. This is insensible water loss. There's also insensible water production by means of oxidation of food, some 300 ml of water is produced. So the difference of this will be 700 ml. So roughly 700 ml of water per day is lost without our knowledge. Different books give different values. Some say the total insensible water loss is 500 ml. Again, this varies with the season. Suppose if it's a cold season, only 300 or 400 ml would be lost. The insensible water loss will be less. Suppose patient is in a very humid condition, hot condition, excess sweating is there. Patient may lose even 1000 ml of fluid. So roughly we'll say 500 to 1000 ml is the insensible water loss. So from the patient is having some output as urine output is there, plus this insensible water loss of 500 or 1000 or 700 ml should be the intake of the person because that is going to that is that is the actual fluid balance so if you are able to calculate the urine output addition of 500 ml to compensate for the insensible water loss will give the total intake for the patient so these are the ways how will you calculate the daily requirement for maintenance fluid understood by weight it is 40 ml per kg or pediatric is by using the holiday cigar formula or if the patient is under your supervision, you are able to calculate the output, the total intake equal to output plus 500 ml. This is for a patient who is not volume overloaded. Please remember. Because a person with edema will tell the calculation later. But for a person who is not volume overloaded, he is normal. This is the actual fluid you have to do. So for a coma patient, next time, 4 is the maximum fluid we give. But is fluid alone the main thing? Fluid alone is not the actual calculation which we need. We need to know how much calories he needs. We need to know how much sodium he needs. We need to know how much potassium he needs. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, calories roughly they say at least 100 grams of glucose is needed per day for adult pediatric again there is calculation 100 kilocalories the same like holiday cigar formula 100 kilocalories for the first 10 kg like that there's a separate formula but roughly adults need around 100 grams of glucose per day sodium is three milli equivalents of sodium per day three milli equivalents per kg of sodium per day potassium will be two milli equivalents per kg per day so roughly a 40 kg person will need 100 milli equivalents per day. This is an average. Potassium, they need average 60 milli equivalents per day. 60 to 80, sometimes even 100. Right? So a person needs 40 ml per kg of water per day, 100 grams of glucose per day, 3 milli equivalents per kg per day, and 
2 mL per kg per day. Now, based on the fluid composition, I told you, can you frame a rough maintenance fluid regimen for me? Question. Just a rough regimen, any regimen is possible. I told you totally we need 2 to 2.5 liters, right? 2 to 2.5 means 5 pints of fluid should be given. Now that is fixed. So patient is in coma, he is not taking any fluids. So we have decided to give 5 pints of fluids for him. Or we will make it just 4 pints because coma patient is going to get some IV fluid, I mean drugs, drugs are given through again IV fluids. So we will leave off that. He may be given some fluids through Ryle's tube. So excluding that, we can give 3 to 4 pints per day. So we will have it as 4 pints of fluid per day. Now, what fluid we will give? Because whatever fluid you give, should give 100 grams of glucose, uh, 100 millicolons of sodium, and 60 millicolons of potassium. That's the ideal requirement. Any guesses? Yes, sir. Uh, can, give... can I give 5% extras? 5% distros, if patient is in a... Yeah, patient is in coma. A coma, but any uh, any brain condition, stroke, he can't be 5% Yeah, it distrust. could be a brain condition causing coma. So 5% dextrose is not the ideal fluid to replace his re glucose requirement. So this is ruled out. I, but, I told uh, you DNS... Uh, but... Yeah. So, either we can go for a DNS. Okay, DNS is a possibility. So, in that case, that... 1 liter of DNS will give 50 grams of glucose. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can give 1 liter of DNS as per your wish. Yes. Okay. And DNS the remaining 50 a... grams, shall I give uh, 1 liter of isolate? Isolate Yeah. Isolate him as very... potassium also, right? How much potassium? Yes. Potassium it has 35. Yeah, 35. Uh, uh, the remaining your... I think can give us oral syrup KCL we can give. Uh, Out yeah, of yeah. 60, we are given 35 mL. Okay. DNS, yeah, how sodium. much sodium it contains? Sodium. 154. 154. That is more than 100. So we are replaced that also. Yeah. So, so, this, this regimen is ideal. You can go for 2 pint DNS and 2 pint isolate M. Yeah. Or 1 pint of sodium chloride. But if you give 1 pint of sodium chloride, sodium will be more in this patient. It will cause hypernatremia. Yeah. Because I'll, requirement is only 154. We already replaced 154. This isolate M contains around 35, right? Around 200 we are given. If we give uh, one more saline, it will add 77. So, that will be even excessive. So based on that, you have to calculate. Oh. Okay, suppose if it's a post-op patient, not at all taking an IV fluid, he's conscious, just on an NPO sake. Or a poisoning patient, he's just for an NPO sake, he's there. Uh, based on body weight, we have calculated five pints of fluid is required. What will be the option for this patient? Just an NPO patient who is very conscious. Any regimen you can plan for this patient. Also, we can go for the same regimen. Eh? One yeah. Thing. Okay. And uh, but, uh, 5D also possible because patient there is no uh, brain at all. Okay. This patient shall we give 5% extras? That's no contraindication, no. Uh, no contraindication. So we can go for 5% extras. Okay. The thing is, the above regimen, we are giving more of sodium. Isolate M DNS gives more sodium to the patient. 5% extras, we didn't give any sodium at all now. So, 1 liter we have given, 50 grams of dextrose we are given. Now, what about 1 DNS? Yes. Or 2 DNS shall we give? This 2 DNS yes. will have 154 millicolons of sodium, which is more than the requirement of sodium. Plus, the yeah. remaining 50 grams is done. Okay. The remaining 1, this... you can give NS with KCL, we can give. 
or any isolate you want to try? Yeah, we can go for isolate the MRS too. Patient is in Riles tube, I told you. So he'll be draining more of uh, fluid outside. So he is more prone for developing alkalosis. So suggest a fluid suggesting having producing acidosis. NS is a better option. Yeah. Isolate G is a better option, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But did any of you ask me the chloride level? Because no. isolate G contains more of chloride, right? Chloride. Yeah. If you give isolate G, it will raise the chloride level. Yeah. That's the reason why we have to see sodium, potassium, and chloride for most of the patients who is having vomiting or diarrhea. Because only that chloride level will help to decide whether to give which fluid to the patient. If the patient is having hyperchloremia, mm. uh, low chloride. If he is having low chloride, isolate G will be the better option because it contains high chloride. Sodium uh, saline, I mean, isotonic saline will be a good option because it contains 154 millicolons of uh, chloride. Suppose patient's chloride is already high, these two are not very good options. We need to give a fluid with a lower chlorate level. Like an RL something. Mm. Yeah, understood. Yeah. This is how you titrate. So for maintenance fluid, the thing is this. And you should know the daily fluid requirement, uh, the daily intake output and insensible water loss, the total calorie which is needed, the total sodium which is needed, the total potassium which is needed, then the choice of fluid should depend upon the his volume status, his clinical status, his acid base status, and his electrolyte. Right? Based on that, you can titrate a fluid regimen. Any doubts still here? So initially we we can start with 40 ml per kg per day. Then after yeah. seeing the urine output and all. We can calculate mm. insensible loss along with it and give mm. the next day's intake, right? Yeah, yeah. This is only for maintenance. The simplest one I am telling, this is only for a maintenance patient. Okay. Right? But maintenance won't come to us mostly. Only maintenance in our side will be a coma patient or an ICU patient coma or a poisoning patient. That's the only thing which we see. Why I took so much of time to explain you about maintenance is Never forget about potassium, never forget about uh, magnesium, never forget about cal giving calories. Okay. And electrolyte. it's not only the fluid, it's the entire acid base status, the entire electrolyte which is going to change because of the fluid. That's why it took some time in explaining this. Now coming to our most important thing, which is replacement indications. So the indications are fluid, one is maintenance. You have understood that very clearly. The other indication yeah. for fluid is replacement. So what is replacement? Patient has lost some fluid by means of a vomiting, diarrhea, a burns patient, or some uh, conditions causing excessive water loss like a pancreatitis. In that case, we have to re replace fluid. Or some old age patients who have never taken food for a long time who are dehydrated, we have to replace. The golden thumb rule which you have to remember for replacement is Whenever patient has lost some fluid, we have to replace the existing loss. Okay, replace the existing loss. Plus, we have to replace ongoing loss. Ongoing loss is patient comes with diarrhea. Just remember that. Uh, he has lost around uh, 500 ml of fluid by diarrhea alone. That is existing loss. Ongoing loss is he still has diarrhea. He has diarrhea some 3 to 5 times per day. So, 5 times per Per day, each uh, volume of stool is around 300 ml, is, around 1000 ml of fluid is lost per day. This is ongoing loss. So, patient who is having active diarrhea while in planning a fluid for him, we had to calculate the existing loss, we had to calculate the ongoing loss plus the maintenance. So, what's the actual maintenance two liters, right? But these two liters we need not give because if the patient is able to take oral he'll be able to drink 1 to 1.5 liters by himself, even though he's sick. So, the actual plan when you have to write is the total fluid should be mentioned as actual. So, the total fluid per day will be roughly for this patient. Existing loss was 500 when he came to you. 
you are predicting an ongoing loss of 1000 ml so uh, that comes to be around 1500 plus the total maintenance fluid based on his body weight 40 ml per kg has come around 2 liters so 3.5 liters is the total intake for him assuming he is not in any volume overload status right so this is the total fluid requirement now you split this based on his oral if he is able to take orals normally 1.5 liters can be given orally the remaining 2 liters should be given as fluid and so this is how you calculate for a replacement so existing loss plus ongoing loss plus a maintenance understood till now the choice of fluid is the same for vomiting yeah for vomiting there's a ongoing loss of acid there's an alkalosis so you have to give fluids causing acidosis ns is a good option isolate g is a good option in case of shock we can give rl also uh, not taking into account the acidotic uh, alkalosis those things suppose if it's a diarrhea there is more of bicarbonate loss so there is acidosis we have to give fluids causing alkalosis so rl will be a better choice in the case of diarrhea there is vomiting or diarrhea with uh, or there's combination of both see which is predominating see which electrolyte is predominating based on that you decide among the fluids right this is how you now the next question which comes to everyone mind everyone's mind is patient has come with diarrhea for 2 to 3 days he has come to you are vomiting for a particular time how to calculate the amount of loss existing loss because we don't measure vomiting or diarrhea how much amount has gone it's just based on the patient's history so how to calculate the fluid loss in gynecar obstetric side in postpartum hemorrhage they have a rough calculation right if there is tachycardia 1 liter is lost if there is hypotension 2 liters is lost like that that's a rough calculation in dehydration there's one simple formula the rule of 1 2 3 that is mild dehydration 1 liter is lost that is up to 1 liter is lost moderate dehydration up to 2 liters can be given severe dehydration up to 3 liters can be given mild moderate severe i think you can this patient is just having symptoms of thirst he is having dry mucosa so moderate dehydration like patient is having some aka just a tachycardia some irritability you can tell it to be is in mild dehydration so on seeing the patient when you say severe dehydration is in a coma state or severely drowsy state okay is in severe aka shock low bp these things is severe dehydration so this is how you calculate how much of fluid is lost so i will give you a scenario patient is having vomiting okay let's put everything together now patient is having vomiting plus diarrhea for 3 days duration he says diarrhea uh, is around 8 to 10 episodes per day very severe diarrhea vomiting is not telling the actual amount <clears throat> okay so when he comes here he is nearly in a state of shock bp was just 80 60 He has a history of fainting. Is there? He is still having diarrhea. I don't know. I think he will be a sixty kg person. I am not an adult male, sixty kg male. Okay, but the blood investigations have not come to, uh, so far. Now, how will you plan the fluid regimen for him, and what will be your plan? Tell with substantiation. Hello, for actually for sixty kg. The daily request two point four liter rough calculation. Okay. okay, okay. Then so this definitely we have to give. Now patient hmm. is having six patient, so under three liters we have to supplement. Okay, three liters. So then sorry, existing loss three liters. Ah. So existing loss, then we have to cater to the ongoing loss. Okay, ongoing loss. I think we can make a guess. Ah. Uh, Eight episodes per day, around three hundred uh, ml of stools like that we can calculate. So roughly, I think one to two liters. Okay. Or 
time to time basis suppose if that's a 300 ml of diarrhea roughly uh, we can note it down like that so how much has come 5.4 liters so roughly 6 liters roughly he needs 6 liters per day this is the total intake everything cannot be given as iv fluids so in that 3 liters we can ask him to take oral if he say but he's having vomiting so he cannot take that 3 liters around 1 liter we can encourage oral the remaining 5 liters can be given as iv fluids this is warranted because he is in shock. So, 5 liters is roughly 10 pints of fluid, right? Mm. So, 10 pints of fluids per day for him can be given because he is in shock. So, this is our plan actually. Uh, so, we will start fluids initially. Since he is in shock, we can give fluids rapidly. Generally, what they tell is uh, 3 to 4 liters. Sorry. 2 liters can be given in 6 hours. Or 30% of the fluid can be given in 6 hours. Pediatrics, this is a thing. Whenever there's a fluid loss, they say 100 ml per kg or majority of the fluid should be given within 6 hours. The remaining should be given as maintenance. So that means we can give from 4 pints in the next 6 hours as a plan. The remaining 6 pints, slowly we can give it as maintenance. So this will be our initial plan. What fluid you will give? Vomiting plus diarrhea. You don't have any blood investigations. Vomiting plus diarrhea, we can go for either normal saline or ringer lactate. We have to see yeah, which is shock. Eh? He's in shock. So here, acid-base balance doesn't matter. Initially, we have to retain more fluid. Oral is a good choice oh. because diarrhea is predominant. If NS can be given, okay, NS can be given, but preferably we can we have to give diarrhea because diarrhea loses potassium, diarrhea loses bicarbonate. Is isolate M uh, option for this patient? Actually, that is a uh, fluid for maintenance, no? Yeah. Here, the shock is the main thing. So, we have to give a fluid which retains more of fluid. So, RL or NS are the only two choices here. There's no role for isolates. There's no role for dextrose containing fluids because it will aggravate the shock. So, initial choices either NS or RL. Nothing more than that. So, we'll reassess after 6 hours. If his BP has improved, okay. Then we can plan on some maintenance fluid or something. If he's clinically stable. Right. Okay. That's okay. all. So, as simple as that. Okay, so this is about maintenance regimen, replacement regimen. Okay, just remember that uh, how fast to replace this. Uh, of the total requirement, 30% can be given in the first six hours. The remaining to be given over the next 24 hours. And titrate based upon time to time basis because some persons may tolerate it, some persons may not tolerate it. So, how to say the patient is tolerating fluid or not? This is the most important. Because we are giving fluid, we should know whether the patient is responding to the fluid or is going in the negative balance. One thing is urine output. Hourly urine output is needed. So, patient is not having an urine output initially. Giving a fluid has increased his urine output means we are in the right track. So, you know the normal urine output. At least 0.5 ml per kg per hour. This is a normal unit output per hour. So, hourly urine output is very important whenever you are giving a fluid, especially in the case of shock. This urine output tells about the adequacy of fluid in case of shock syndrome. But how to tell if you are going in the wrong direction? We are giving excess fluids. But the two things can help. One is the JVP. Third is the pulmonary base hospital, lung base hospitalization. So, if the JVP is rising, which means we are overloading with fluids. If the patient develops crackles, he is going in for pulmonary edema due to fluids. Actually, if you read, to, read textbooks, they will be telling about CVP monitoring while giving fluids plus pulmonary capillary wedge pressure monitoring. But practically, we cannot do it for every patient. So, whenever you are giving fluids for a patient, to assess whether you are giving the right, going in the right direction, look for hourly urine output, 
see the JVP and look, auscultate the lung for crackles. If he develops crackles due to fluid, stop fluid, whatever it is. If the JVP has started increasing or it is very high, stop fluids. Hourly urine output is adequate. Okay, you are going in the right direction. If you are having echo machine available, you can look at the IVC diameter and decide for it. So normal IVC diameter is 1 to 2 centimeter. So IVC is less than 1 centimeter or collapse. We can give more fluids. Patient is still dehydrated. If IVC is more than 2 centimeter, don't give fluids or be cautious in giving fluids. He's volume more low. So actually, I have to look at all these things while giving fluids. Giving replacement fluids. Maintenance fluid, that's not an issue. Only the 40 ml per kg, 3 milli equivalents per kg, 2 milli equivalents per kg story is enough. So we have discussed two indications. Maintenance indication, replacement indication. Next is special indications. Can you tell me some special uses of fluids to correct hypoglycemia? 25% extras. We are giving it as a treatment of choice for hypoglycemia. Then as the route for giving medications, like vancomycin, pipas, etc., we are giving as a route of medication. Fluid challenge. So fluid challenge, I think we can discuss something. Patient comes with anuria, no urine output. Okay, whether to give fluids or not. Hello? Yes. So yes. here this patient is a known case of diabetic hypertensive. Uh, his whole creatinine value was 1.4. He was stable till that. He suddenly comes with no urine output or very low urine output for the past uh, uh, one day, one day or so. You are suspecting renal failure. He okay. comes, you are taking an ABG. ABG shows acidosis. Again, this points towards some renal failure. Okay. Uh, creatinine is yet to come. Will you give fluids for this patient or not? Anuria, yeah. he is in acidosis. Probably in pulmonary edema, whether to give fluids or not. Sir, he is there. We have to find out whether the cause was uh, the worsening of CKD is pre-renal or renal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it is pre-renal uh, hypovolemia, the novelty can mm. supplement fluid. So, for that, we have to mm. give fluid. So, we have to give uh, fluid, pure animal fluid, and uh, analysis, what mm -hmm. uh, 1.5 milligram per kg, and see whether the patient is having okay. any given coming to us. Okay. Yeah, that's the basic. So, the contraindication of fluid. So I told you that all the indications for giving fluids. The contraindication of fluid is any patient who is volume overloaded. So patient is having an obvious edema. Okay. So he is having a heart failure. Past history of heart failure. He is an obvious edema. JVP is elevated. You should not give fluids because already there is a lot of fluid in the body. Whatever, so whatever he comes, we should not give fluid. Suppose he comes in shock, what will you do? You can give inotropes, sir. Inotropes. Now, my question well, is, can you give a trial of fluid challenge? Uh, in patients with the anuria, you're asking, sir? No, no, this is different. Anuria will come later. I'm asking the contraindications of fluid. Fluid overloads. So yeah, that's volume. what I told. Volume overload, we should never give. Volume overload plus shock, can you give? Volume well, overload... Stoke. The effective uh, intravascular volume is depleted in between. Okay, now what about system. patient is in hypoalbuminemia? Okay, like a nephrotic syndrome or a cirrhosis. He comes now. He is in shock. Okay, for them will you give fluids? I put. told the answer. We... It was correct one. Yeah, we can Effective intravascular volume, someone told, ah, right? That effective is effective intravascular volume is decreased, so you can give no, yeah. When I was in nephrology posting, one case was there patient was a case of nephrotic syndrome, 
uh, on maintenance treatment with some st- asathiaprin something okay so suddenly what happened was she had worsening of nephrotic syndrome edema increased the hy- hypoalbuminemia fitting edema we were discussing today no so her edema had increased her bp was around uh, 80 60 or 90 60 something some amount of giddiness she was telling now the uh, dilemma comes here she is in shock okay i told you for shock we can give a trial of fluids it's not wrong so whether to give fluids to increase the bp or i told you volumorolod is a definite contraindication for fluid so if you give fluids sir volumorolod will agree with what to do she is in hypoalbuminemia she is in shock if you give fluids bp will improve definitely but at edema may agree with okay she is in okay what to do in this situation i think you can give diuretics if you give diuretic again intravascular volume will reduce so, so it's a dilemma so you can Tablets give work. fluid okay yeah that is the ultimate thing intravascular volume is the one which is going to this in a case of cirrhosis in a case of nephrotic syndrome so never give lasix no lasix should not be given in nephrotic uh, nephrotic edema nephrotic edema mm. yeah because it, the pathology is not a venous overload it is yeah. loss of antibiotic fluid is leaking yeah. out if you are yeah. giving more of last six it may reduce the edema but it is it not uh, the that intravascular. it will worsen in the intravascular volume status so here the intravascular volume is less so we can give fluids here in spite of edema we can give fluids in definitely in a case of nephrotic syndrome same thing holds good for a heart failure edema also. suppose patient is sick patient is in shock okay we can give a trial of fluids whether he is tolerating or not if he is tolerating well and good if the bp picks up and the urine output picks up it is well and good suppose patient is not tolerating the trial of fluids you should not give fluids you should go only with your dopamine dobutamine those things down down right so the app yeah in this nephrotic syndrome and uh... will no it's better to give a fluid challenge with a dose of diuretic fluid challenge with diuretic nephrotic syndrome i am against giving diuretic other conditions we can give with diuretics like in heart failure plus edema like heart failure edema plus shock we can give fluid we can give with a minimal dose of diuretic <coughs> so that he won't get volume overloaded okay nephrotic <laughs> syndrome i don't think uh, last <coughs> is a part of the management at all hey lasix orikkilum kodukal yeah lasix is not a part of the management of nephrotic syndrome we are wrongly given only albumin protein supplementation prednisolone is the treatment of choice lasix has no role in nephrotic syndrome okay okay any more discussions here so the absolute contraindication of fluid therapy is volume overload but if there is a state of shock if you feel that giving fluid may improve the patient we can suppose if the patient is in frank pulmonary edema okay volume overload is different pulmonary edema is different can you give fluid uh sorry it's not volume overload pulmonary edema plus shock pulmonary edema is an absolute contraindication okay you will understand that but pulmonary edema plus shock whether to give fluid the end get sir see volume overload is a contraindication of fluid but volume okay. overload plus shock whether to give i told yes nephrotic syndrome definitely yes heart failure we can try pulmonary edema is a contraindication of fluid pulmonary edema plus shock whether to give fluid or not there are no, some we can try i am not talking never 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 pros we can try no there yeah inotropes we can try but not fluids fluids because right sided volume overload i mean right sided heart pathology we can give you some amount of fluid because it will bypass the right and it will go to the left heart and it will improve perfusion right shock is a disease of left heart volume overload i mean fetal edema is a mainly a problem with the right heart so you can give fluid in a case of volume overload but pulmonary edema plus shock don't give okay so regarding edema now i think your doubt will be clear based on the clinical scenario we can decide whether to give fluids or not 
Now what about Anuria? The question sir, of sir, Venus. Sir, sir, I, I missed the last part. Pulmonary edema plus soft, you shouldn't give. Le. You shouldn't give. But plain pulmonary edema also you don't give, right? Yeah. Yeah, plain pulmonary edema is a contraindication. But suppose he comes with shock and pulmonary edema, whether to give or not. So why did you put that tick there? I put an into mark. Palm, oh, no, palm redima is a contraindication. I mean, uh, mean when you take put. Okay, then I'll put double into absolute contraindication. Uh, no, absolute contraindication. Only the second so and third thing is. You understood that. Yeah. That wally morlot and palm redima are absolute contraindications. Okay, wally morlot plus shock we can give. Hypoalbuminemia plus shock we can give. Palm redima plus shock don't give. I think now the mark is correct. Now it's correct. Now the mark is correct. Okay, similarly, the question of funuria, whether to give fluids or not, yes, definitely we can give fluids. Plus, as uh, for those 12, we can give last. Uh, hypoalbuminemia plus shock, no. It's better uh -huh. to go with uh, fluids and uh, albumin supplementation, no? Yeah, correct. Okay. So you can give fluids. If albumin is available, we can give albumin. Okay. Oh. That is okay. the best option. Arvinda, yes. Uh, sir, what about uh, patient person with up to MI uh. developing uh, unknown diabetic, developing DKA? Hmm. And DKA, I'll discuss later. So, you are telling a DKA patient plus MI? MI is a low infection pattern. Uh. So, it, He was asking DK, we have okay. to give fluids no, as the first line. Am I with a heart failure, low ejection fraction? What can be done? Uh, I write uh, that? See which is the most priority. Okay, so I'll write down that situation also. What he's asking is patient is having MI plus uh, pulmonary edema plus DK. Right, DK, we must give fluid. Palmeridium, we should not give fluid. MA with palmeridium, again, we cannot give fluid. So, what to do in this situation you are asking? Am I right? Decide which is the most priority. Palmeridium is the most priority because that is going to kill the patient in a very short time. If you are giving fluid, it is going to get aggravated. But not giving fluid is not going to immediately kill DK. Sir, uh, one doubt, sir. In this case, uh, no. Mm. Pulmonary mm. plus K. Mm. Uh, uh, it depends on whether what MI it is, whether it is interval MI or uh, interval MI. No, MI plus pulmonary edema, obviously, it's a left ventricular oh, MI only. Uh, yeah, if it's a right ventricular MI, fluid is the treatment of choice. That's no doubt on that. Right so ventricular MI, we are going to give fluid. So, so it, in this condition, so no, it's uh, better to go with the IVC at all, no? IVC. That no, when pulmonary edema is there, there is no point in seeing IVC. IVC is a manifestation of right ventricular thing. Okay, hmm. pulmonary edema or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a manifestation of left ventricular pressure. If a patient is having pulmonary edema, it means left ventricular, left atrial pressure is high. Okay. So, left ventricular is not able to tolerate the fluid load. If you are giving a fluid through the venous system, finally it is going into the left atrium, left ventricle only. It is again going to get accumulated in the heart. So, IVC will not be a proper measure of the left ventricular pressure. Okay. Right. Okay. Why we are seeing okay. IVC is the generalized volume status, venous status we are seeing. So, IVC will not get pulmonary edema management. Okay, 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 sir. Okay, so in this case, as Aravind asked, I feel uh, pulmonary edema is the life threatening situation. So, giving elastics and managing that is the first priority. Once patient stabilizes, comes out of the pulmonary edema, we can slowly give fluids. But here we have to give only insulin as the management of choice in this situation. Any controversies, Dr. Aram? Similarly, these patients also, also develop AK. Sir. That means shock only. Again, pulmonary edema plus shock is contraindicated. Like that one, you know? Wait, we'll discuss that also. Uh, this one question. Is if this patient is developing the AK wings, no, that may be uh -huh. mostly 
ஆரம்பிச்சிருக்கோம்ஸ் <laughs> but now one scenario will be very challenging suppose mi patient with dk plus pulmonary edema plus shock hmm. again the same thing sir uh, here we can any we have to start i not of support no yeah but i think shock so is the most give anyway. priority here so we'll go for hydrotropic support Uh, we have to treat the underlying shock plus ak all this dk angle uh, pulmonary edema all this happens because of mi no so most hmm. any we have immediately take the to treat or, mi or something no yes yeah, still pulmonary edema mi is the priority so you have to treat that only never consider hmm. about dk sugars we can manage like suppose this right. situation pulmonary edema plus dk plus shock plus ak again same but like inot drops only only support you care we can dial up the patient hello dialyze the patient there dialyze dialyze the patient because there's no other way we can support the kidney because dk is damaging the kidney shock is damaging the kidney pulmonary edema cardiorenal syndrome so whatever thing is that everything is going to damage the kidney uh, sir but one more doubt sir in this condition yeah. no Whether a patient mm. can be dialyzed or not dialyzed, uh, but no, that depends on the uh, cardiac condition also. No, because the, if the EAP is very low and all, no, he mm-hmm. can draw the fluid to the dialysis machine. No, mm-hmm. can burst. Yeah, that is individualized it. treatment depending on the situation. This is just an imaginary situation, and you <laughs> which to prioritize. Your thing so is practical. Is, if you are seeing the patient is, based on the situation only, we'll decide. He is at the verge of arrest. There's no point in doing any treatment at all. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, we discussed all these cases only to show that there's a situation where we have to give fluid. There's a situation where not to give fluid. We have to prioritize. If there's a volume overload, like uh, Arvind was asking, suppose patient is having a heart failure plus a DKA, whether to give fluid, we can give cautious fluid. That is accepted. Okay. Okay. because mm-hmm. dk is going to cause volume depletion even though the patient is clinically in a state of edema if the clinical situation warrants is in uh, a borderline bp we can give some amount of fluid but in the case of pulmonary edema plus dk definitely there's no role of fluids that's what this thing i was telling oh, volume overload plus shock or plus dk there's a situation where you cannot give fluid like a volume overload plus a situation where we must give fluid like dk or shock volume overload it is accepted but in the case of pulmonary edema we should never give fluid okay okay same thing holds for ckd ckd volume overload no fluid suppose uh, he develops uh, sudden anuria okay, previously was uh, excreting fluid uh, that is previously was diuresing now suddenly he comes in a state of shock we can give fluid but he is already is an aneuric patient wait i'll write it clearly ckd plus no aneuria till now sir one part of the yeah sir if it is pulmonary edema or any other cause such as valvular heart disease causing a pulmonary edema then then also then also the same thing then also the same thing any pulmonary edema contraindicate un- un- unless it is non cardiogenic pulmonary edema due to ards yeah, any cardiogenic pulmonary edema it is fluid is contraindicated uh, ms you are meaning mechanical yes, ms with 
no pain Allah, ms yeah. when there is no pulmonary edema they say in the intraoperative status we have to give more fluid but if you give more fluid he will not tolerate that he'll suddenly develop pulmonary edema alla this ms patient is not always prone for uh, backward heart failure no so if you are giving yeah. that much uh, ms patient no patient will invariably go to uh, pulmonary edema pulmonary edema yes ah. any cardiogenic pulmonary edema that's no uh, that is definite contraindication for fluids only no doubt on that okay so ckd plus no anuria till now plus volume overload no fluids now the same patient suddenly develops anuria or suddenly develops ak here we cannot differentiate when the patient comes whether it is uh, pre renal ak or renal ak whether to give fluids or not fluids we can give a trial of fluids plus trusmate as discussed trial of fluids plus lasix suppose a ckd patient already had no urine output okay already no urine output he comes in a state of shock whether to give uh, fluids or not uh, that shock may be either due to some sepsis he will not he will not pass your in no ah he cannot pass your in no so there's no point in giving fluids fluids so we are to... already is anuric okay. so whatever you do his kidney is completely gone now it's not going to function at all it's not going to excrete the fluid so whatever indication you are going to give the fluid it is going to cause nephrogenic pulmonary edema so even though it is shock there's no point in giving fluids you have to try only inotropy you have to find out the cause and treat it accordingly what's the maximum tolerated amount of fluid which can be given to a ckd patient <laughs> maximum fluid per day which That's can the... be given to ckd patient how much sir uh, that depends on the fluid status of the patient no fluid then stage avlo la pose and intake equal to output plus 500 mm-hmm. if the patient is anuric yes, only you are going to give 500 or some, i told na no, 500 to 1000 ml some oh. say 700 ml some say 800 ml so mm-hmm. patient who is anuric that is a dialysis patient the maximum fluid is only 700 ml okay suppose he has oh, come I... for some acute indication to you hello sir can you please say see i told you one formula earlier right intake ah. equal to output plus 700 ml or 500 ml right <coughs> so the patient is completely anuric output is zero so the intake which can be given to him is 500 ml what is that 500 ml it is the insensible water losses which is happening yeah correct so okay, okay. suppose assume a situation where a ckd patient who is anuric has come to you with shock okay so we are not going to give any fluid at all now we cannot give more than 500 ml there are situations we can give fluid for example a patient the same patient ckd anuria on dialysis he is coming with a some shock bp was 70 60 7050 something uh the av fistula is going to collapse only if the bp is good av fistula will not collapse in case of shock av fistula will collapse so to prevent that collapse what some people will do is they will uh, transfuse some 250 or 300 ml immediately okay that will replace the blood pressure immediately then they will maintain with iv fluids so in that situation we can give maintain with iv fluids i will no no iv fluids diuretic is not going to act in ckd patient won't hey, not pass diuretic you. maintain with iv fluids or inotropic iv fluids you understand But the point know. in one situation so a... oh. they are giving fluids immediately to prevent the collapse of the av fistula okay then they maintain with inotropes Yeah, that is what I said. I know tops, not yeah. IV fluids. Yeah. Oh, I told diuretics, ah. Huh? 
no you are saying iv food so iv food no no i not sorry i not drops i not drops ha so if if at all you give a challenge it should not be more than 500 ml for other patients yeah. we can give up to 150 uh, 1000 ml so okay. again based on the situation so patient with ckd comes with shock the maximum amount of fluid which you can give for that patient is only 500 ml so we cannot take the liberty of giving 500 ml or 1000 ml entirely as fluids so our main focus here is to give inotropes but in case of situations where there is severe shock patient is stable we have to preserve his av fistula we can give a trial of 250 to 300 ml of bolus of uh, fluid to immediately replenish the bp then we have to maintain with inotropes we cannot give fluids beyond that because it will cause pulmonary edema plastics will not have that much of effect in such patients because he he will not diuris so only fluid restriction is the ideal option plastics will have an effect in such patients not by increasing the urine output but by causing pulmonary vasodilatation and reducing the pulmonary congestion so lasix will have an effect but not that much of effect in such patients so the only way by which you can recover this patient is by doing a dialysis if he develops pulmonary edema only dialysis will save lasix will not have that much of an effect you would have seen in your nephro posting la patient comes in florid pulmonary edema that how much of lasix you give it will not have that effect only giving a dialysis or a cpap will help in recovery yeah. right yeah. so i think these are the doubtful situations which come volume overload pulmonary edema anuria then ckd patient mm. any doubts on this doubts will come practically when we manage okay shall i summarize till now what i told in 5 minutes yes sir i think this meet how was the class okay so summarizing fluid management so basic thing is whenever you are giving a fluid you should know whether to give fluid for the patient or not if you are decided to give fluid what fluid to give how much fluid to give how long to give and how to monitor the patient so those things only we discussed uh, so the common fluids available are crystallites and colloids crystallites will be ns half ns rl 5% dextrose 25% dextrose dns and the four isolates isolate g p m and e so the basis is ns contains 154 milli equivalents of sodium and potassium it doesn't contain any other thing uh excess of sodium chloride can cause acidosis half normal saline is 77 plus 77 milli equivalents of sodium and potassium rl is called as the most physiological fluid because it gives uh, 130 milli equivalents of sodium 109 milli equivalents of chloride four milli equivalents that is it contains sodium chloride potassium calcium as well as the lactate gets converted to bicarbonate which corrects acidosis now in the presence of liver failure what happens is liver cannot convert lactate it will cause lactic acidosis so in liver failure rl is not the ideal choice we have to give only ns in case we have to give in renal failure also what happens is lactate gets accumulated it will cause lactic acidosis so in renal failure and liver failure this rl is not the ideal choice we have to give go with moderate amounts of ns and 5% dextrose and dns contains 50 grams of glucose per liter the main disadvantage of dextrose containing fluid is two reasons one it causes hypotension by uh, causing it's a hypotonic fluid the entire fluid enters the icf second it is not the ideal choice of fluid in cerebral edema or any brain lesions 25% dextrose is a special indication fluid where we give it to correct uh, hypokalemia uh, hypoglycemia 3% saline again is a special fluid where which we give to correct uh, hyper hyponatremia okay and among the isolates i told you isolate g is the gastric replacement solution because it contains more of chloride plus it corrects the acidosis occurs due which occurs due to vomiting isolate m is the normal maintenance fluid so when discussing about maintenance i told you normally a person requires about 100 milli equivalents of sodium Uh, 60 milli equivalents of potassium nearly half of that is provided by isolate m that's why it is called as the ideal maintenance fluid 
ఐసోలేట్ పీస్తే పీరియాట్రిక్ మెయింటెనెన్స్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ద సేమ్ థింగ్ ఇన్ విత్ లోవర్ డోస్ హాఫ్ ఎన్ఎస్ ఇస్ ఆల్సో మెయింటెనెన్స్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ఇన్ పీరియాట్రిక్స్ హాఫ్ డిఎన్ఎస్ రిమెంబర్ దట్ ఐసోలేట్ ఈ కంటైన్స్ మెగ్నీషియం ద ఓన్లీ ఫ్లూయిడ్ విచ్ కంటైన్స్ మెగ్నీషియం ఇస్ ఐసోలేట్ ఈ ద టూ ఫ్లూయిడ్స్ విచ్ కంటైన్ కాల్షియం ఆర్ ఐసోలేట్ ఈ అండ్ ఆర్ఎల్ అండ్ ద ఫ్లూయిడ్స్ విచ్ కంటైన్ హై అమౌంట్ ఆఫ్ క్లోరైడ్ ఆర్ ఎన్ఎస్ అండ్ ఐసోలేట్ జీ సో యూ షుడ్ బి కేర్ఫుల్ when uh, giving that the fluid which contains high amount of potassium are all the isolates especially isolatium and the fluids which cause acidosis are ns and uh, isolate g the fluids which cause alkalosis are rl and uh, isolate p and isolatium the other fluids right so whenever you are prescribing fluid three things only you have to remember uh, what is the volume status of the patient what is the electrolyte status and acid base status only this should guide you in deciding what fluid to give so first thing the first question which should come to your mind is whether to give fluid to the patient or not whether for a maintenance indication whether for a replacement indication or whether for a special indication maintenance indication is patient is not taking the fluid so we are giving something so the important formula is start with 40 ml per kg per day which is the total fluid and that fluid should contain 100 grams of glucose per day 3 millicolons per kg per day of sodium and 2 millicolons per kg per day of potassium suppose if the patient is in your monitoring he has started giving a urine output your intake should be 500 ml excess of the output 500 to 1000 ml in a liberal manner so the next indication will be a replacement indication in case of replacement indication three things what was the existing loss for which i told you the 1 liter 2 liter 3 liter rule mild dehydration they have already lost 1 liter moderate dehydration they have probably lost 2 liters severe dehydration maximum 3 liters of fluid may, may be lost so roughly you can uh, think about that plus you have to calculate the ongoing losses plus the maintenance fluid per day we have to calculate totally based on that based on the situation yet always remember patient in shock whatever be the situation ns or rl are, are the only fluids which are life saving if the patient is stable then think about the electrolyte status acid base status and uh, give the fluid i told you a rough method to calculate write the 1 liter 2 liter 3 liter rule that's actually a formula for actually calculating the how much amount to give in the case of hypotension so 0.2 into lean body weight into patients hematocrit by normal yeah. hematocrit minus 1 so if the hematocrit value is available we can find out how much uh, dehydration is in so normal hematocrit is 45% if his hematocrit is 55 it means he is dehydrated so if you put this formula and calculate we can find out the amount of fluid which is given but this is a theoretical formula practically 1 liter 2 liter 3 liter rule is uh, highly useful <clears throat> and the special other indications for uh, fluids will be hypoglycemia correction hypercalcemia treatment fluid challenge okay hyponatremia correction all these things we give fluid now the all problem comes when the problem of volume overload problem of pulmonary edema problem of ckd comes always remember volume overload is a contraindication for fluid but volume overload plus shock you prioritize whether to give fluids or not if fluid is possible you can give fluid pulmonary edema never to give fluid a patient with anuria or an acute kidney injury we don't know whether it's a pre renal ak or a renal ak so you can give a trial of fluids plus lasix if output is coming we can continue with fluids okay it doesn't mean any patient with the renal failure should not be given fluids they can be given fluids because pre renal cause is the most common cause of uh, anuria suppose a patient uh-huh. who is already anuric due to ckd he is a dialysis patient the maximum fluid which you can give to him is 500 ml so preferably you can we have to give minimal amount of fluid plus maintain with uh, inotropes and diuretics and next question is how, how will you instruct the sisters to give the fluid the last part like for example we have calculated is maintenance is 2 liters of fluid per day right so you have planned like a okay, 5% extra you are going to give two points and uh, one point you are going to give ns and one point of isolate m so assume that this is the plan you have had for the patient at what rate will you give you have something called as rule of 10 
so we are giving 2 liters in 24 hours means multiply this 2 by 10 which is 20 drops per minute okay so the 24 hour fluid requirement into 10 will give the number of drops per minute that is rule of 10 suppose if you are have so rule of 10 should be applied if you know the 24 hour urine 24 hours requirement suppose if you know the hourly requirement hourly requirement is suppose uh, <clears throat> patient is in shock you are planning to give some 200 ml per hour okay based on the calculation i told you right uh, patient totally requires some four pints of fluid uh, you have to give that fluid within 30 percent should be given within six hours based on the calculation if you are deciding to give 200 ml per hour divide this by four 200 by four will be 50 so 50 drops per minute Okay, the drip rate should be calculated as such. Rule of 10, if you know the 24 hours requirement, multiply that by 10, which gives the number of drops per minute. Or if you are having a hourly calculation with you, hourly requirement with you, divide that by 4. This is rule of 4. Divide that by 4. You'll have the number of drops per minute. Okay, so I thought of covering some aspects of hyponatremia fluid correction, when to give 3% saline, when to give NS, in what rate to give, but I think that will be better taken as a separate topic. So, hope you understood some basics about fluid, their composition, when to give, when not to give. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Ah. I use for this and half DNS, other than hypernatremia in adults. Huh. Other than hypernatremia, we have to use half in this. Uh, in DK, usually what they do is initial first two days, they'll be giving soda, uh, normal saline. Then onwards, patient will has the risk of going into hypernatremia. So they'll change the fluid into half normal saline. Okay, okay. okay, so third day of DK, we can give. Hypernatremia correction, definitely we give. Otherwise, in adults, it doesn't have that much of role. Half, DN, half DNS is a replacement fluid in pediatrics because yeah. adults can tolerate 154 milli equivalents of sodium. Pediatric age needs a lower amount of sodium only. So I think half DNS is a maintenance fluid in pediatrics. Adults only these two indications I know. Not much of yeah. Moreover, you. it cannot be used. It's a hypotonic fluid, so it can also aggravate cerebral edema. So it has not much of use in adult uh, medicine. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Stop recording. Uh, that was very useful. Plus.